Happy Sunday, everyone. It's good to see you. We are experimenting with the microphone today. First of all, I just want to acknowledge the beautiful playing of Carol Holford today. That prelude was really, really beautiful. Thank you, Carol, for that. Oh, yeah, applause. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. So I have a few announcements. First of all, you've heard me say this before, but I think I've been pretty good. I haven't mentioned in a while. We need greeters. We need greeters. We need greeters. <laughs> we have a number of people who are liturgists, and we have liturgists for the next month or so, and I love that. That's such an important part of our ministry and our worship. But we need people to join us, to set up, to take down, to distribute uh, the, the bulletins, right, to welcome people. Even if you could do it once a month or once every six weeks, we really need greeters. As you know, we have a faithful group, a remnant, but it's the same people over and over again. So if you find yourself looking to involve yourself in ministry or do something for our congregation, greeters, right? Please, it's so, so very important. Where is the book? There's a, there's a binder in the back. There's a binder in the back, so please do sign up. Thank you for that. Second announcement, and Richard is here, and I'm so happy, and I'm sure he could vouch from what I'm about to say. And uh, Mary Jo is here. I want to encourage people. I mentioned this in the Spiritual Care Committee meeting. I want to encourage people as enthusiastically as I can to visit people in Alderwood and Waterford. Please, um, if you know someone who is there, please visit them. Sometimes people, for some reason, become, ask me many questions or become anxious. I, all you have to do is put on a mask, go to the entrance, tell them you're there to visit someone, and just go upstairs. I can't tell you how bored people are there, right? Can you, right? Yes, maybe, maybe. They would love visitors. Again, if you are looking for a ministry to do, I can't emphasize enough how important that is, right? Even if once a month you visit someone, by all means, just go right ahead. You don't need permission. You don't have to ask anyone. Just go and visit someone there. Please, please, please. I want to encourage you to do that. Number three, Bible study. We continue our Bible study of 2 Peter on Tuesdays at 2.30 p.m. in Kinsale. This week we are on 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. If you were not there last week, you missed the juice and cookies. So shame on you. Many surprises in the Bible study. All right, number three. Number four. So last week, uh, Dick Hacker's daughter and I were kind of playing telephone tag. And when we finally connected, she said to me, you know, Fred, I used to come to service with my dad, right? I used to sit over here. And we really love the community and the service. Uh, next weekend, we have some family members coming over. Uh, would it be okay if we came to the service on Sunday? I said, absolutely. And she said, would you mind saying something about my dad? I said, absolutely. In fact, let's do a little bit more than that, right? Because that just didn't feel sufficient. So I said, does he have some favorite hymns? Yes. I said, great. Pick your th his three favorite hymns and we'll play them next week. She said, great. And then I said, would you like to say something? She goes, I would like to say something. I said, great, prepare something to say next week. Uh, and, and she said, well, you know, we have some cookies that we'd like to bring, and I said, great. So, <laughs> so, so I, I said, you know, we'll have our regular worship service next week, right? And then after the sermon, before the hymn, we'll have the remembrances. We'll have remembrances of him. And then I thought, you know, that could be something that we can provide to members who attend the service, right? Dick was a regular attendee. If family members would like something like that, of course, right? I'm there to meet their needs. Uh, and so 
she'd like to do that. If that's something you would like to do, right, just keep that in mind, right, for the future. Um, also, uh, some people ask me about memorial services in general. Again, if family members would like to have a memorial service, we can schedule that, right? And I know that some people prefer the term celebration of life or memorial service. That's fine, right? I'm happy to accommodate. Um, and we can have, if it's a service that's fully dedicated as a memorial service, then that will probably need to do during the week, right? During the week. But, uh, but next week, we're going to have remem remembrances um, for Dick after the worship service. It'll be a part of the worship service. So uh, we're also going to have, in addition to family members sharing some thoughts, we're going to have an opportunity for anyone who would like to share a thought about Dick, right? So it'll be kind of like an open microphone. So just think about that. If you have something you want to share, by all means. Um, in addition to that, um, in speaking to several members at Friendship Village, we've decided twice a year to have an institution-wide memorial service or a remembrance service. So the first one we're going to offer is on Thursday, April 27th. Thursday, April 27th. And I'll make announcements as we come, uh, as we come closer. It'll be at 3 p.m. It'll be right here. And so what we'll do is we'll have a remembrance, a memorial service for all the members who have passed in the last six months. And then we'll do one again in November, right? So every six months, we'll have an institution-wide memorial service. That will be more non-sectarian, right, in nature. So it'll be open to everyone. Uh, but uh, I think um, this is a wonderful gift that Dick has given to us. And he's opened up by, by coming in and, and allowing us to, to remember him. It's really allowed us to think about how we can meet the needs of family members and residents, especially as it relates to memorial services. If you'd like to speak to me privately more about that, by all means. I'm very accommodating. As you know, I'm happy to work with you about that. And then, of course, we have our, uh, our memory book there for Dick, so if you have a chance to write a nice thought, that would be wonderful. Any announcements? Any other announcements for today? Any other announcements? Yes. It's Mary's birthday today. What? Mary's birthday? No, we should sing. We should sing? Okay. Mary's birthday. Carol, we're going to do um, a birthday. Okay. So you started, Carol. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Mary, happy birthday to you. Nice, nice, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Excellent announcement, excellent. Okay, well let us begin our worship service. Have you noticed that our pastor agrees to things, but when there's cookies, he's really? <laughs> the call to worship comes from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Please join with me in the prayer. God, our helper, our shade, our protector, keep us in sunlight and moonlight along rocky paths and pathways unknown, until all our going and coming brings us at last to your eternal kingdom. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. 
Join with me in singing hymn number 525, At the Cross. What should we pray for today? What's on your heart today? Yes.
Okay. Yes. Let us pray. Lord, we begin as we begin all things by giving you thanks. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And we thank you especially for, um, for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. God, our helper, we thank you for keeping our lives always in your care and protection. And we pray for any and all who are in harm's way, for those walking in the midst of danger, for those who are treading a slippery path, for those exhausted and seeking relief, for those who face a mountain of worry or debt or any other obstacles. Be guardian and guide, we pray, setting all our feet on your paths of righteousness and peace. We pray for those who are struggling with a new challenge or call, with a major transition in life or livelihood, with their faith and understanding, with grief anew and ancient. Keep in your tender care and mercy, O God, those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit, those weighed down by depression or pain, those recuperating from surgery or accident. Protect not only us and those we love, but also the whole wide world you so love. In places of war, bring peace. In places beset by natural disaster, bring calm and restoration. Where there is unrest and injustice, make justice our aim. And Lord, very specifically, we continue to pray for the family of our brother Dick to be with them during this difficult time. Lord, we pray for all the residents at Friendship Village. We ask you to bless them. Bless especially the residents at Waterford and Alderwood. Let them know that we hold them in our hearts. Lord, we give thanks for Mary and her birthday, and we celebrate with her, Lord. Lord, we lift up the people of East Palestine. We ask you to be with them during this time. Lord, we pray for the people in Ukraine. We pray for peace there, Lord. We pray for the people in Turkey and Syria, Lord. Lord, we ask you to open doors so that they can find homes and comfort and food. Lord, we continue to pray for Philip as he continues to live with lymphoma, and we lift up Doris Lee also, Lord, be with her. Lord, we lift up Shirley as she continues to recover and is experiencing discomfort and pain. And Lord, we pray for healing for her. Lord, we lift up Michelle and Maria, and we ask you to provide them emotional support, Lord. And Lord, we pray for our nation and even specifically for our government, our government. We ask you to give them truth and wisdom and discernment and compassion to bring us together. So Lord, we lift up these prayers to you and the prayers that we keep silent in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Now, I know I'm the absent-minded professor because I forgot our prayer of confession, right? So I need to borrow, Pat, let me borrow this. 
So forgive me for this, but I'm embracing my... Yeah, I'm just embracing the way I am now. Yeah, so please join me in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, we struggle to understand the new life Christ offers. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to be born again into the life of Christ, trusting that you have included us by grace in the family of faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. Oh, Lord, once again, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of mercy and forgiveness. We ask you to just be gentle with us when we come off the path, Lord. We thank you that you're always there, willing to embrace your arms the way the father embraced his prodigal son. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us share with each other the peace of Christ. The scripture today is from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born again after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As you know, the first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels because for the most part, they are very similar or can be seen all together in a synopsis in three parallel columns. Now, there are some stories that are only in one of the three Gospels, like the parable of the Good Samaritan is only in Luke. Some stories are in two Gospels, like the infancy narratives. Uh, They're both in Matthew and Luke. And some stories are in three Gospels, like the temptation of Christ. Each Gospel is unique and special as they all share a perspective of the Lord. Just like four different friends of yours or ours would share a distinctive perspective and voice about you, and maybe even some distinct stories about you. And sometimes based on the pers- our personality, excuse me, sometimes based on the personality and the style of the gospel, we might find a special affinity toward one gospel or another. But together, the four Gospels provide a full picture of who Jesus is and what he's done. The four Gospels together provide us the full Gospel of Jesus Christ. In John 21, the last two verses in the Gospel, he writes, This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, as you know, I follow what's called the Revised Standard Lectionary cycle of readings, which which is used by many denominations, Protestant and the Catholic tradition. It's a three-year cycle of readings. Year A focuses on the Gospel of Matthew. Year B focuses on Mark. Year C focuses on Luke. And it's a three-year cycle. And throughout the year, uh, especially during Lent and Easter, we'll read passages from the Gospel of John. Now, we are currently in year A, which is why most of the Gospel passages we read are Matthew. Starting from the first Sunday of Advent, until the next Sunday of Advent. Now, I share all this information first as a source of Christian education, and secondly, to help us understand that when we read the Gospel of John, he tends to use more metaphors and symbolism and theological discourses. It's not more spiritual or more difficult, but it tends to have a different style than the Synoptic Gospels. Um, And in today's reading, we have a beautiful example of this. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Now, Nicodemus is a fascinating character in the New Testament. He was, as you know, a Jewish Pharisee, which means he was a teacher of the law and therefore incredibly knowledgeable about the teachings of Judaism. He was also a member of the Sanhedrin, an assembly of men in every city in Israel. And there were some lesser Sanhedrins for each city, and the greater Sanhedrin, which served as a type of supreme court on matters of the faith. And by being a member of the Sanhedrin, one could presume that this was a person of wealth and prestige, and Nicodemus was its leader. Now, here is something that tells us about the heart of Nicodemus, how much he honored and respected Jesus. At his cru- after the crucifixion, when Jesus died and was buried in John 19, we read, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. 
Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, weighing up uh, at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds, or 75 pounds, some translations say. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. So Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin, but it was Nicodemus who brought the mixture of, of myrrh and aloes in order that Jesus' body would be buried in the burial custom of the Jews. What a profoundly tender and spiritually significant act. Here is an older man who is saying through this ritual, you are a son of the Jewish people, worthy to be clothed in the attire of the heavenly rest. Here is a man who had profound respect for Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things that you do apart from the presence of God. Imagine how precarious it must have been for not only a member, but the leader of the Sanhedrin to be in dialogue with Jesus. And so in order for him to maintain a semblance of privacy, he met with Jesus at night. And Jesus responds, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus asked Jesus, an appropriate question. How can anyone be born after having been grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus, reflecting his pharisaical tradition, interprets Jesus' response in a literal manner. But Jesus invites him to see the bigger picture, the deeper issue. Now, we've all been like Nicodemus. We try to understand the deeper issues, but sometimes are blinded by the darkness of the nighttime. Sometimes the nighttime reflects our woundedness, our brokenness, our sinfulness, our unmet needs, our shadows, our ignorance. But we are truly and honestly trying to make sense of life. And so Nicodemus, like all of us, is searching for some type of light to help us understand more deeply and more cl and clearly the truths of life. And so Jesus begins to use metaphoric language to explain this. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is, is spirit. Do not be astonished. For I, uh, that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, traditionally, this is often used uh, uh, theologically to demonstrate the importance and connection between baptism and the Holy Spirit. Here is Jesus, the poet, painting a beautiful spiritual picture with words, helping Nicodemus and helping us to elevate our understanding of the faith beyond what the eye can see. Jesus is inviting us to look deeper. When I was a teenager learning how to drive, uh, my instructor explained to me that when driving, one must look directly at the car in front of you <clears throat> to make sure it, it doesn't stop suddenly and that there's enough space between two cars. You also have to look beyond to anticipate what can happen down the road. And you have to look side by side using your peripheral vision to see the cars that are passing by you or if you need to change lanes to make sure you don't crash into them. And you also have to look in the rearview mirror, seeing if a car behind you might be too close or if you need to speed up. The same is the case with the spiritual life. 
Sometimes in our legalism or literalism or dogmatism or stubbornness or assumptions or woundedness, we look at something with such a narrow focus that we miss the bigger picture. We might think that something is insignificant, but when we step back and open our eyes wider, we begin to see that everything is connected. Now, there's been much excitement and discussion about our beautiful new altar covering, right? We spoke about this in the Spiritual Care Committee, especially uh, on this more contemporary image of the cross, which Beverly Francis did for us so beautifully. Some of us had a difficult time seeing the cross when we were too close to it, right? But we needed to step back to capture the fullness of the design so that we can see the cross more clearly. Question, is my vision too narrow? How might I develop a more 360% perspective of my spiritual life? Sometimes it's painful to re-examine a thing in our lives. We'd rather not look at it, avoid it, or deny it. And when someone or something shines a light on it, we respond angrily or afraid. We tend to respond with flight or fight or freeze. And perhaps Jesus is telling us, like he's telling Nicodemus, you're missing the bigger picture. You're stuck on this one thing. Step back and experience the fullness of the kingdom of God. Several years ago, I read an article in the New York Times entitled, Why We Experience Awe. And it states, Professor Keltner and psychologist Jonathan Haidt argue that awe is the ultimate collective emotion that for it motivates people to do things that enhance the greater good. Through many activities that give us goosebumps, collective rituals, celebration, music and dance, religious gatherings and worship, all might help shift our focus from our narrow self-interest to the interest of the group to which we belong. It continues, in one experiment, feelings of awe were evoked in the lab. For example, by having participants recall and write about past experiences of awe or watch a five-minute video of sublime scenes of nature. Participants experiencing awe cooperated more, shared more resources, and sacrificed more for others, all of which are behaviors necessary for our collective life. Now, on the one hand, as Christians, we might say, this makes sense to me. Our faith teaches me to experience awe. And this, I think, is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. You're focusing too much on the narrow. Open your eyes and see the awesome wonder of God and God's creation, especially in the relationship you have with others. On the other hand, maybe the harder question we need to ask ourselves is that in spite of the fact that we pray and come to church and sing hymns and welcome each other in fellowship, why do I remain so narrow in my views? What is preventing me from experiencing more awe in my life? What is blocking this experience? What do I need to change in order to see God more abundantly in my life? It's interesting to note that John does not have Jesus work a sign or perform a miracle. He prefers simply to let the words of Jesus educate, inform, impact Nicodemus. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. He's not making a division between heaven and earth. We need both water and spirit. Jesus invites us to elevate ourselves. 
No need for miracles, but to know more about Jesus in order to more clearly see Jesus. That is the miracle. To experience Christ in our everyday lives and encounters. That is the miracle. To experience awe in our everyday activities. That is the miracle. In our conversations, this is the heavenly ascent. This is how we elevate ourselves and others. Amen. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right and a joyful thing to give you thanks and praise always and everywhere, O God Almighty. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. We praise you for forming us in your image and for calling us to be your people. You sent us prophets and teachers to guide us on the journey. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who took on human form to live and die as one of us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite us in one holy church. Therefore, with the entire company of saints, in all places and all times, we praise you with joy, saying together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in your highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the juice that we drink may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into him, Christ our Lord. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, Take, drink, 
This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread we eat and the cup we drink is the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for us.
Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for us. Please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence and the simplicity of this holy meal. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Send us now into the world in peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in our final hymn, 31, To God Be the Glory.
May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord protect us from all anxiety and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen.